All right, here we go. Hello, and welcome to the Cogswell Macy Act Training Teachers of the Deafblind and Deafblind Interveners. My name is Annika Stolas, and I am the Resource and Dissemination Manager here at AUCD. We would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, before we begin, I would like to address a few logistical details. First, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on AUCD's webinar at the close of the event. Um, we, a we ask uh, for folks who are not speaking to have their video cameras turned off so that just the presenter and the interpreter are on screen. Um, we will do a brief introduction, then a presentation, and then um, we will have questions. We can ask questions at any point during the presentation via the webinar chat box. Um, at the end, if you have questions and you want to voice those questions, just raise your hands and we'll unmute your mic. Um, I will now pass the mic over to Michael Norman, the co-chair of AUCD's Deaf Blind and Deaf Blind uh, discussion group. Michael? Good afternoon, everybody. This is Michael and welcome to the webinar that we're doing this afternoon. It's certainly a pleasure to be here and to see so many familiar names on my screen. Um, this webinar is an interesting, uh, has interesting origins. The uh, special school district within Louisiana is interested in expanding and creating more services as it relates to the deaf blind population here in Louisiana. And as such, uh, they have a committee within their um, schools and within their administration who are currently learning about services across Louisiana and across the United States as it relates to interveners and uh, teachers of the deaf line. And in addition, they were interested in knowing a little bit about the progress of the Cogswell Macy Act. Uh, we had the great fortune of being able to ask Linda Alsup to present for us today, and goodness knows she was available and willing to do it. So we are very, very happy that Linda is available and is able to provide us information today. By the way, I also want to send greetings from my co-chair, Julie Durando, who is in transit to a physician's appointment but she's gonna join us via the cell phone. So Julie, hi and welcome. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Linda Alsop to you. I think that you've probably all read her little bio, so you know enough about her to know that she has a long history of uh, advocacy and participation with the deaf blind here in the United States. She had the first uh, training program for deafblind interveners at the university level in Utah and continues to um, manage that program and to grow interveners for us to be used across the United States. Uh, Linda also has been very active in the advocacy for the Cogswell Macy Act, so she's certainly the go-to person to provide us information about that. I also wanted to send a shout out to the National Center for Deaf Blindness, who is also interested in this, in what we're doing. And um, Christy Probst is also online with us today. And uh, we're pleased that she is able to be with us as well. So without further ado, Linda, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Cogswell Macy Act and the training of teachers of the deaf blind and deafblind interveners. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm assuming you can see me. Um, <laughs> I am very, I was very excited when Michael contacted me and asked if I would share information today, uh, especially during this special week, about uh, not just Cogswell Macy, but about uh, interveners, about training, about teachers. There's a lot of information out there and so what I hope to do today is give you um, 
pieces of information that seem most relevant for our conversation today, but also links and resources so that you can do more uh, research on your own. There's a lot of information out there and I would encourage you to uh, check some of the websites that I'll refer to so that you can get more information about that. If you have questions as we go along, I think Michael said to go ahead and put that in the chat box so that at certain points in time, I'll try to pause and then we can try to address those questions. And then of course, at the end, we can have a discussion of whatever questions and what things that you have. So thank you for your time today and I'll go ahead and share my screen now and we'll get started. I wanted to start the conversation today on the act itself. There's a lot to understand about it. Um, it's been around for quite a while and I put this part, this slide together to show you that it first started in the 113th Congress, which was 2013 and 2014. And at that time, the deaf blind, we had not uh, become a part of the Cogswell Macy Act during that Congress. Uh, it was after that, that um, those of us that were working on the coalition and in other groups found out about it and went to the two authors at that time. Uh, one is Barbara Ramundo and the other was Mark Rickert and asked them if they would be open to a third title. Uh, that would deal with the deaf blind. And at that time, they were gracious enough to say yes. And so we went through that process then of writing Title III with input from the field. The things I'll share with you today had input and uh, others looked at the wording. And so if any of you have interest in how that was vetted and how that was done, I can answer that question also. But basically in the 114th Congress, was when then Title III was added to the Alice Cogswell and Annie Sullivan Macy Act. Now that's the full name, but you'll hear people say Cogswell Macy just because it's shortened. So if you read that on any website, you'll know that it's the same bill. Uh, the sponsor, the person who introduced it at that time was Matt Cartwright, who is a Democrat. And at that time, there were 43 co-sponsors. You can see the year before, there were 21 co-sponsors along with Matt Cartwright. So adding Title III, I think we gained more momentum with getting 43 co-sponsors. Then in the 115th Congress, 2017 and 18, uh, again, and just, just to give you a little background, what happens is if a bill doesn't pass in a congressional session, then it it's considered that it died, basically it dies. And so then it has to be reintroduced in the next Congress. So when you see Matt Cartwright's name here, he is the one who has continued to support this since uh, its early inceptions. So in the 115th Congress, then we ended up with a Senator who added his name. So originally it was mostly people from the House representatives who were part of that and it was very important to try to get some senators on board. So it was Senator Edward Markey who stepped up to say, okay, I'll make this a bipartisan uh, bill, which means it comes from uh, both the House and the Senate. And also it, although, excuse me, I used the term wrong, it comes from the House and the Senate, but it was still mainly Democratic. As you can see, it was, it's been a Democratic supported bill. There was just one co-sponsor there in the Senate and 48 co-sponsors in the House in, one, in uh, the 115th Congress. So we are now in the 116th Congress and uh, we are uh, the 2019-2020. Again, it had to be reintroduced and you can see also that the House bill changes each time. So HR means House of Representatives. That number is now 4822, and in the Senate, it's 2681. So each Congress, the number will change. So that can be a little bit confusing. Uh, but where we are at this point in time, uh, we're looking at 4822, and in the Senate, uh, 2681. So my next slide is to show you who those are. So at this point, we have 
uh, 20 co-sponsors from the House and three co-sponsors besides Senator Markey from the Senate. Now we added another one, so I think it's 21. So here are the co-sponsors as of today, night before last, John Carter from Texas was added on. So you can see that besides those who introduce it, you'll see that there are then at least 21 co-sponsors. And then in the Senate, we have Shelley Moore or Shelley Caputo, Mike Braun, Elizabeth Warren, and then also uh, the original uh, gentleman from who originally introduced it, which was Edward Markey. So that gives you a sense of what we're looking at in terms of the representatives. Um, the idea is to continue to gather more sports or more support, more sponsors. You'll notice that uh, it's been a very democratically supported uh, act. And so one of the things that uh, we've been working on is to get the Republicans uh, to support it. Um, passing a bill is very difficult. If any of you want to go online and see what it takes to pass a bill, there's, it's quite a process. And so in terms of the expectation, I think it's important to know what that is. I'm just going to go to the next slide here, which will give you the screen share of where you'll see this. So this is what you would look for if you go on to congress.gov. So I wanted you to be able to see what you're looking for so that you can spend some time, maybe after this presentation, uh, knowing you can see what that looks like, how it's, uh, how it's presented there, and we'll look at the wording down below, the text down below. But this is what you'll look up if you go to congress.gov and you can see at the top, it'll say forward slash bill, forward slash 116th Congress, forward slash House bill, forward slash 482. So you can kind of find your way through it and go through it and read the text as you're interested. Now, just to step back and say, what is the expectation? It's very difficult to have bills pass through Congress. And this bill is a large one because it has three different sections to it. So it represents not it represents the blind community, the deaf community, and the deaf blind community. And that's a large bill. That's a large group of constituents to please and to have support it. And so at this point in time, what we've been assured is that our efforts related to lobbying are to really help with uh, creating awareness, to create conversations, uh, at, in Congress, in the Senate, and in the House to familiarize the legislators with the issues, with what the concerns are and what the problems are. And in, in many ways, the hope has been that IDEA would come up for reauthorization. And then, because this bill has been in Congress now for several years, that when IDEA is looked at, reauthorized, there would be wording that would come directly from the Cogswell Macy Act into IDEA. Some of it would be there, people would be familiar with it. So um, I have not heard any one of the original people who've worked with it say they expect the bill to pass as it is in its entirety. The expectation is more that it will continue to create awareness, keep discussions going, and that those needs will become very obvious to the representatives and that there will be wording that can be included in IDEA um, uh, from this act. Um, uh, unfortunately, with IDEA and with all the issues uh, that have gone on this past year during this Congress, uh, many things like this have been slower to go through, as you can tell. Um, these are not priority things when with the virus and the other things that have, occur have occurred, it's been a more difficult climb to try to get co-sponsors. Um, so I wanted you just to familiarize you with this and then we'll go right into the text. But this is what you'll see when you go on there. You'll be able to look at text. You'll be able to see co-sponsors, committees, related bills. It's really a good website. Um, just to... be clear about 
uh, these three titles. When you go on there and you begin to scroll down, you'll see that the act itself includes these three titles. So the first title is for students who are deaf and hard of hearing or hard of hearing. So the term is improving the effectiveness of special education and related services. Title two is for students with visual disabilities. And then title three is the title that I've described that we've added related to children and youth who are deaf blind. So when you go on and you start reading it, I'm gonna be quoting from title three today as we continue to talk. But if you have any interest in the blind issues and in how that's written or the deaf issues, you're welcome to go on there and read through that. Um, just know that there are organizations who are working for the deaf community. Barbara Ramundo represents them in her community. And then NAD has been supportive. And then AFB and those other groups have been those that are helping with the blind. So it's, it's a very much a collaborative effort. So just as a summary, um, the hope is that it will ensure that every child who is deaf, hard of hearing, blind, visually impaired, or deaf blind, regardless of whether they have additional disabilities, will be properly counted and served. So that was one of the, the beliefs and tenets. Two, each child's unique learning needs will be properly evaluated. So you'll see language about evaluation in there. Three, states will engage in strategic planning to be sure that they can, in fact, meet each child's specialized needs. So that has to do with state plans. The fourth one, the U.S. Department of Education will do its part to hold states and schools accountable for their plans and their, what they do. Uh, the next one, students who are deaf will be served by qualified personnel. Then students who are blind will receive state-of-the-art services and skills supported through a new major national collaborative initiative addressing their unique learning needs. And three, students who are deafblind will have access to trained and qualified interveners. So that's the language, again, that you will see on the websites in terms of what the hope is or what they want to ensure through this act, through this bill. Now, as you read through it, you'll note that there's sections in each one. So as we were working on Title III, we had to uh, mirror the section on state plans, the section on evaluation, the section on child count. So as you read through that, you'll see that there's parallels there and you'll understand why um, so that there is uh, continuity between each of those pieces. Um, as far as <clears throat> uh, how what's happening with Cogswell Macy and as I said before uh, the progress has been slow um, and there are there have been some people <clears throat> some of the different um, constituents who have taken issue with different parts of the act and I think that's inherent <clears throat> and when you write a bill that is such a broad bill that covers a, a range of needs of sensory loss, you're going to have uh, people who take issue, who don't support it. So if any of you are interested in the ups and downs or those that the, the ins and outs, so to speak, as this has progressed through the Senate, again, you can find that online. That information is available. I'm not going to talk about it today. <clears throat> but it is not necessarily a smooth path related to some of the constituency who take issue with different parts of it. One of the things that has been helpful for us is that we haven't had in the deafblind community any groups take issue with Title III. And that's been uh, really a strong show of support it also reflects the fact that when Title III was written, it was indeed a collaborative effort. And <clears throat> there are people who read it, gave input to it, people who were involved. And so now, as far as Title III goes, we don't, we don't have anybody stepping up saying, <clears throat> we don't support this part or we don't like that part. And that's not the case in the other two sections. So see where we go next. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I think what I'll do is um, go right to some sections of the bill. 
So because we're talking today about interveners, training of interveners and training of teachers, I'm going to highlight these sections. But again, if you go to that congress.gov, that website I showed you, you'll see all this wording under the appropriate sections. So <clears throat> one of the things that is there in section 301 is identifying children who are deaf blind. One of the problems that you know we've had is been the definition of deaf blindness that's been in the regulations. Uh, one of the things we did is work with a group who had um, you know, worked on this. And so I just want you to note here that um, you can see somewhat of a definition in this, in this uh, language here. If you'll just go down, I'm gonna say, when a state classifies children, they identify, locates, and evaluate children with concomitant vision and hearing losses who are, or may be classified in a disability category other than deaf blindness, meaning concomitant hearing and vision impairments, the combination of which causes severe communication and other developmental and educational needs that adversely affect a child's educational performance and including children who are deaf blind with additional disabilities. And then <clears throat> the rest is uh, pretty much standard wording. But I wanted you to note that, that it was a way of slipping in a kind of definition to try to help with the problems that have been in place in our field related to the previous definition that had to do with where a child can be educated rather than this type of definition relating to the sensory loss. So just an FYI that that is in section 301. I wanted to also now jump to the conversation around um, interveners. As you know, those of us in the field that have been working for a lot of years on the intervener issues, the end goal has always been to have interveners be recognized as related service providers, um, just as interpreters are listed and recognized as related services. So this is the language in section 302. It will say that this section is amended by inserting and intervener services which are provided to children who are deaf blind by a qualified intervener after and then for diagnostic and evaluation purposes. So this tells where it would be inserted and we, that talks about a qualified intervener being available and assigned to a child who's deaf blind. So that's in section 302 and it's under related services. So section 302, section 602 is related services and in Cogswell Macy, you'll find it in 302. Now, just as a little bit of a heads up, if when a bill is made, if a Congress approves a bill or an action, it becomes statute is the term they use, which means it becomes law. Then after that happens, there still has part of the process is that whatever was determined as statute then has to be translated into regulations. So the Department of Ed writes the regulations based on the statute. And then of course, as some of you may know, every state writes their own uh, regulations also. But just so you know that that's another piece of the process. Now, as we've been doing, uh, really promoting the related services piece. We've done some other types of lobbying besides Cogswell Macy. And this had to do with a call to action that came out on the federal regulations. So the regulations that are already in place related to IDEA, there was an opportunity to modify those or to give input to those. <clears throat> so this is the wording that was used and there was a very good groundswell, it's been about three years ago now, where parents called in and I wanted you to see the, the wording that was used then. This was uh, proposed in the current regulations that they would be modified by inserting intervener services after interpreting services and before psychological services as shown. So if you read that, it's what's in the regulation now in IDEA of what related services means. And again, this is services. These aren't people, this is services. But you can see in there, you can see interpreting services, 
intervenor service and psychological services. So again, that's part of current regulations that we have been trying to impact uh, as long as ID is in place. And this gives you a little more language of the efforts related to that. Uh, we also had to do a definition of services and it means services provided by a qualified intervener that enables a child with deaf blindness to receive FAPE by facilitating access to visual and auditory information, communication and interaction in the child's mode of communication and instructed instruction needed to learn and make meaningful educational progress. So that's the definition that we put forward related to amending the current regulations. At that time, <clears throat> it wasn't approved, but there were a lot of people who wrote in that requested it, and uh, we had some support from Ruth Ryder, who is in OSEP. So again, these conversations aren't new. They're being had uh, as we go along through the months and as the needs come up. And so Cogswell Macy is a piece of these other efforts. I kind of wanted you to have this larger view that there are other efforts going on besides Cogswell Macy. And the hope is that, you know, we're, we're spreading ourselves out, the information, our legislation, our advocacy, in, in the hopes that we will finally be able to accomplish the goal. And again, the goal is to have interveners recognized as related service providers. I wanted to show you one other part of Cogswell Macy, and that has to do with personnel development. So it's under subtitle C, you'll read that again if you go to that website, but you can see under personnel development to improve services, we wanted to show that there were sufficient teachers. This is in there's the teachers of the deafblind and early intervention specialists. So <clears throat> you can see under 2G, it says preparing personnel to be qualified teachers of the deafblind and early intervention specialists to assist children with deafblindness in schools and school related activities, as well as toddlers and preschool age children with deafblindness in early intervention and preschool programs to develop communication and literacy skills, access, organize, and utilize information about the environment and acquire concepts essential for learning. So there's the wording about teachers of the deafblind. That was <clears throat> very strong advocacy for that and continues to be, as some of you may know, uh, for that to be recognized at the federal level that that wording would begin to be part of IDEA and that that would mean that funds and personnel prep programs would be able to step in and do more work. There are some programs that are training teachers of the deaf by now, but there are few programs and funding is always an issue. Under H then we put in preparing personnel to be qualified interveners as individualized supports to assist children with deafblindness in school and school related activities and infants and toddlers in preschool aged children with deafblindness in early intervention and preschool programs. So that covered not only school age, but early intervention and preschool. So you can see it's under um, uh, the personnel development piece. Uh, it does focus in on early intervention. It includes early intervention, which is good. It's not just school age, but there's where we have the term intervener. Now, if you wanted to go on to that website I showed you, you could do a search on interveners and you would see where it is. You know, each place where interveners are discussed in Cogswell Macy, you could do the search, you know, basically on anything. Um, so do we have any questions? There's also a place talking by interveners, uh, talking about interveners under the findings. It's called findings. And you'll see that on that page. And we had to submit, we submitted eight findings and one had to do with interveners. Two actually had to do with interveners. And then what happened was then uh, the office that the sponsor they go through and they uh, have their attorneys and stuff figure out the wording. But you'll see uh, four and eight, and I'll show you eight as we move forward, but you'll see those. And then if anybody's interested, we have findings on eight different categories 
about deaf blindness that you won't see in Cogswell Macy, but were submitted to the legislature. Okay, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about now what interveners are and why we're working so hard to have them be related services. Um, do we have any questions, Michael, at this point? This is a good point for questions. Right now, Linda, I, you are doing such a good job. No one has any need for a question. You covered everything. So okay. uh, none at this point. Okay, thank you. So again, um, there's a lot there, but my hope is this will be clear to you. One of the things that we found as we were doing advocacy work with parents is that they felt that we would get it passed in one Congress. And um, we were trying to be very clear about saying, this is a difficult road and this is what the hope is. And this is why we're lobbying to keep deafblind children and blind and deaf children in the conversations to, to, do, uh, to do what we can advocating. So let's just talk a little bit. When I talked with Michael, he said, we'll just review um, why why we've spent so much time on interveners and what it is about them. Um, and again, this is for many of you on here, this will be not new information, like a no brainer, but I can tell you from my work, uh, my national work with different districts, there's still so much that is not understood about deafblind children at the level, at the district level, at the family level, at the state level and so it is a constant thing that we do to educate to make people aware and to advocate and we know that um, in the in my early years of uh, advocating I was told you know that list of related services in IDEA is a non-exhaustive list which means it doesn't include everything you know, you can, a school district or a state can name another uh, service as a related service and they can put it in their state code if they want. And that is the case. My own state in Utah has put interveners in our state code as a related service, which is what a state can do. Um, so it is in Utah, officially interveners are related service in Utah. However, many states are not following that lead uh, because of, you know, maybe lack of information or strong advocacy at the state level. So we still constantly, and I mean constantly, find these children <clears throat> going into educational programs where the district has never heard of interveners. Uh, the district doesn't support that because it's not in a document, it's not in print anywhere. And so there's, uh, we don't see a lot of states stepping up and say, we're gonna put it in our list as related services. In fact, we have some states who have said to us, until there's something at the federal level, we're not gonna change anything at the state level. So we're still working on, on having these federal changes uh, so that then states hopefully will follow through and then we'll see some better change at the, the district level. Uh, this is just a quick slide in case any of you, um, uh, you know, this might be a little bit new. Why do children who are deafblind need interveners? Um, I've, when I have stood in front of committees to advocate for that question, it always comes up. They say all children benefit from a one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, all kinds of disabilities do. And so we've had to be clear about why it's not a Cadillac, that this is, this is appropriate practice for these children. And we have to be clear about articulating the learning issue. Um, I'm having trouble getting my computer to click on the next thing. Okay, this is, okay, I'm gonna go to these. Okay, so if we look at it, this graph, 
of what typical learning is and how most of us have learned, we put it into like a pyramid so that when we've learned from our childhood, most of our learning has been very direct, or a lot of our learning has been hands-on. So basically the three types of learning are represented here, the direct learning, which is hands-on, the secondary learning, which means kind of what you're doing today, listening to somebody else talk or going to school, listening to a teacher. And then incidental learning is all the other learning that occurs automatically without any effort. It's just that flow of information that we get through our vision and hearing that we don't even focus on, we don't work for, there's no effort. We have that from the moment we're born. And that makes up the largest majority of what we've learned in our lives. And so what we're looking at when we talk about children who have vision and hearing loss is we're looking at the opposite of that because we know that without, let's see if I can get that, there we go. We know that what happens with children who don't have the flow, they may have some vision, they probably have some hearing, some vision, but the flow of information is partial, it's incomplete, it's inconsistent, um, there's a lot of problems with brain development. As soon as that child is born, the brain is forming differently because of the lack of information that's available as the brain is developing its networks. So learning becomes a very different thing for these children. And it's really the opposite of what the typical learning is. As you can see, it makes sense that children who don't have good vision and hearing, they're gonna depend a lot on touch and a lot on hands-on experiences in order to develop concepts and understand. Secondary can be difficult. If it's all auditory and there's very little hearing, then that becomes a barrier. The incidental learning is very, very difficult. Again, because of the lack of vision and hearing that doesn't flow. So what we see is this is a unique problem for educational settings. Our educational sitting, setting, if you go in, I've been in some wonderful classrooms, as probably you have, for students who are, you know, especially in, in um, preschool, in first, second grades, lots of information, visual, auditory, lots of good teaching going on. But the problem is students who are deafblind don't have access to that. It just doesn't flow to them. It, they may see bits and pieces, but they're working very hard together. And so for them, education has to look more like this and less like this. And that is different from the way education is designed and the way education thinks as teachers uh, of how we think. So again, what we're grappling with is a problem with information flow. It's just not able to go naturally. It's, uh, there's a barrier there that the information's out there, but it's not getting in, the child can't access it. And so it makes learning very difficult. I've put on here the seven components of learning. So it's interesting that we, to learn something, we have to go through these seven things. First of all, we have to receive it. And that's where our students, you know, are, are, have that barrier, right, to begin with. So you have to receive it, then pay attention to it. You have to do gathering of it. Then you'd interpret it. You synthesize it with what you already know. You generalize it and remember it. That's quite a process for learning. So for our students, they're, we're stopped at receiving. That's the struggle right there on receiving because it may be all around, but the student is not able to receive it. So this is where our students are very markedly different from other students with disabilities. And that's why we say that intervener has to do with that information flow. I've used the term delivery system. Sometimes that seems um, more comfortable, but there has to be a delivery of information going on, which includes communication, it includes everything, literacy development, conceptual development, language, everything has to do with the, the fact that that intervener is putting into place that information flow and also 
there, the, there's that receiving. So it's a back and forth thing. There has to be someone who's receiving that information from the child. And we really want to encourage that. So the trick here again is what's in IDEA that this has to occur in the child's mode of communication. And that is a very important statement because if no one knows the child's mode of communication, there is no FAPE because um, the, the environment is, becomes restrictive. And again, that intervener is there to make sure that the information's going in, that whatever's possible is coming out. So again, just a quick graphic, if people ask you what's different about it as they do, as I've seen that occur, we have to say that it's not unlike what Helen, in, what Annie Sullivan did for Helen. Um, Annie Sullivan was considered a teacher. Uh, she wasn't called an intervener, but it was the same idea. She became the bond between uh, Helen and life and the, the communicator, the interpreter, the teacher, all of those things. If you've studied Helen Keller's life, you know that throughout her life, she had someone there. It wasn't always Annie Sullivan, but Helen Keller always had somebody go with her when she went to speak or when she went out and around. She had someone there uh, providing access for her. So again, just a quick definition, and um, you, I'll show you kind of where it is now in, in uh, Cogswell Macy, but just a simple one. It's a person who works consistently one-to-one -one with a child who's deafblind and has training and specialized skills in deafblindness. The training thing is a very key piece because deafblind children have had AIDS over the, year. that, over the years. That is not a new model but it's the recognition that this person has to have a set of specialized skills in deaf blindness and then has to deliver those in a very specialized way. That's, that's the, what we're uh, saying is the important piece. Let me see. Okay, so the role of the intervener, again, uh, simply this is birth to death. So if you can think of a child, you can think of an adult, it's access to information that is barred because of vision and hearing. It's communication, the development and use of receptive and expressive skills. It's that trusting interactive relationship that promotes social and emotional development. And there's all kinds of research now that supports this piece, that the social and emotional well-being really must be taken care of for all children or learning doesn't occur. So these are three strong things that the intervener does as their major role. And again, I've had adults say to me, well, I want all those things. I need someone, I may call them an SSP or I may call them someone else, but they're basically doing these three things for me. Uh, just one quick thing I wanted you to see that we have kind of a definition of interveners in Cogswell Macy. It's at the front on that page. It's under the findings. I wanted to point that out to you so you can see that where you say children receive one-to-one -one services from interveners who have training and specialized skills in deaf blindness. Interveners play a critical role in the provision of a free and appropriate public education because they provide access to the information these children need in order to learn and develop concepts to facilitate their communication development and interactions in their preferred mode of communication and to promote their social and emotional well-being. So that again is in the findings of Cogswell Macy. So if you look at that, you'll see good wording, you'll see good pieces that you could take and use if you're sharing with others or teaching others or trying to communicate with others about uh, what we're working on nationally or about what we want to do at a federal level, this is another section of good wording. Um, I said I would talk a little bit also about the training. And this piece, I think it's important for us to discuss because there's some issues that have come from our training with systems change. Um, we've been doing systems change probably now for about 18 years specifically. It feels long, it seems long. I hope we don't go another 18 years, 
But when we first started to work on training issues, we went to the Council for Exceptional Children and asked for uh, competencies. We were told we need a standard, a national standard of what these people do, what their knowledge and skill level needs to be. And so at that time, again, a group got together and developed intervener competencies and then went to the CEC and worked with CEC to have those approved. And they had quite a process where they, sorry, I hope that didn't break your ears, um, where they had quite a process of uh, being able to uh, look at those. And at that time, CEC said, well, the only place we could fit you in, because they don't have competencies there for interpreters, which is interesting. CEC doesn't have competencies for interpreters. But they said, if you will align with the paraprofessional advocates who were at that time working with CEC to develop paraprofessional competencies, we will go ahead and approve these. So at that time, those were approved to read. Uh, knowledge and skills needed by paraprofessionals who work as interveners with uh, children who are deafblind. So that's the wording that went into the CEC competencies. And initially, the paraprofessional competencies were combined with the deafblind competencies because, again, that was put into that uh, folder, so to speak, in that category. As we've been moving forward over the last uh, five to 10 years on this advocacy work, our wording in Cogswell Macy and in all the things we're discussing is specific to related services. So now we're scaling up, if you've heard that term. We are raising our conversation. We're increasing our vocabulary because we know that we have to have these people recognized as related services so that um, they will be valued, just like interpreters are, just like other related services are. And so we've had to look, step back and look at what we've been doing related to training and, and also to make some adjustments. Again, it's part of moving forward um, with our systems change efforts. So one of the things that we did in the early years and that I did was a lot of in-service training. There wasn't really much else available. And as we've moved forward, we've realized as we've looked into the evolution of the interpreter practice, of the evolution of other related services, higher education becomes the path for these, uh, for these uh, professions or these careers to be recognized as related services. So our advocacy now is very strongly toward higher education. And um, the biggest, I'm going to try to show you the advantages there. Um, it's recognized as the foundation for professions. So if you go in and you look at related services, and we've done that, every listed related service except transportation. So every other, and we're talking services, is based on higher education of some kind. So if it's, um, a, say, a recreational therapist who gets a certificate, their certificate is based on the fact that they already have a bachelor's degree in some form of recreation or whatever. So what we're looking at with related services is a higher education career pathway where we have to establish that these people, just like interpreters, just like others, have a high level, they're highly qualified for training, and that they've met the standard of competencies for the knowledge and skills. Um, I won't go through all these, I just put this up there to show uh, the value of higher education and to, and, you know, um, just to give you an idea that that has been the way that professions have evolved. And for these very reasons, there's consistency related to that. So one of the things that again was done early on is uh, again, working through an organization to provide a credential. And we were told again early on that to be taken seriously, 
we needed to uh, have a, a standard, a high standard, a national credential, a national certificate of some kind. And so that was established. And at the time, the groups that we worked with, uh, we settled on or we were able to work with the National Para Center to begin our credentialing process. And that has been what we've used over the past few years. Now we've made a shift from there and we're moving our credentialing into the realm of professional credentialing. Again, that's part of the systems change that I've been describing related to Cogswell Macy, related to all of our advocacy work. So you'll see here that these are the requirements for obtaining the National Intervenor Credential, which is based on the CEC competencies that again have been approved and continue to be approved. So you can just see what that involves. And you, I want, to note, want you to note on the fourth, that the fourth bullet there, that once the intervener has fulfilled the coursework to gain the knowledge, and then the intervener has done the practicum and completed a portfolio, then they will submit their portfolio and their paperwork to the National Intervener and Advocate Association. So we now have a professional organization that is doing the professors doing the credentialing. And again, that is part of, as we have those conversations with, whether we're at the Department of Ed or we're with legislature, legislators, we're saying that interveners should be listed as related service providers and their training and their competence is in sync and in alignment with other related services that they're recognized and they have uh, a standard of excellence that follows that. So I wanted to make it clear that as we're moving forward, if we were using the terminology related services, you will hear that coming hopefully from a lot of us saying, we want this to be related services. You can see it's in Coxwell Macy that way. Uh, we've done advocacy work uh, with the regulations to try to get it that way. Uh, I've done some other work on ESSA trying to get it that way. It's not been an easy mountain to climb, but we're continuing to climb it and we're going to continue to be very clear about the credential being uh, a professional level of credential uh, that has been, again, approved by CEC. And so just so you know, at this time, we have about 100, and I think we're about 125, between 100 and 130 credentialed interveners all over the country. Um, and they are wonderful uh, people when they come out of these programs and they work with these children. They are indeed at that professional level and um, they are, they're wonderful if you ever have an opportunity to meet with them. We continue to have problems with um, um, districts not recognizing the difference. Um, so we'll have, we're still working with districts to understand that as they assign a person to a child who's deafblind uh, and if they get them training or whatever, that that person then becomes more like a related service and less like a paraprofessional. And that's part of, again, our language and what we're working so hard to obtain. And that will help all the interveners who are out there also who are gone through the program, they're credentialed, they're still not being paid very well. We have a lot of systemic issues related to pay and retention and uh, how they're valued in the school system. A lot of those things hopefully will be uh, modified as we get the language put into IDEA and that we get interveners in as related services. So that's a really important effort that we're doing. And again, as I've described, we're trying to get all our ducks in a row so that um, it's very clear that these people are related services, service providers. Um, just one other quick FYI, one of part of our research has been to go into IDEA and to look at all the wording around related services. 
um, it is a different section. So there's a section on paraprofessionals, there's a section on related services. They're different sections. So if you read those, the language is different, all kinds of different wording and language related to those. Again, why we're trying to be very clear that these people are related service providers and they are a cut above uh, what's, you know, the, uh, a paraprofessional. I wanted you to see the two current university training programs, Utah State and then Beth Kennedy has a program out of Central Michigan University. Our hope, we've had some, uh, several other people are working on um, programs. And so our hope is that we will have more, that more people, either community colleges or universities will step up to provide this training so that again, we can continue to keep keep the efforts going related to training these people and having them be highly qualified. I wanted to add some resources here for you. Um, and these are just ones that might be helpful to you. Again, you'll have access to the PowerPoint so you can go back in there and use it. So I think I'm at a stopping point where we can take questions and have some discussion. Um, I'm sure you have some, so what, um, I, I'd certainly love to have, have you ask some questions or bring up some issues that you're concerned about and I'll do my best to try to uh, clarify uh, or explain anything there. So Michael, is this a good time for questions? This is a great time for questions. Um, we don't have questions in the chat box, but if you would like to voice your question, just uh, unmute and raise your hand, uh, and we will be able to take your question live. I notice we've got several people online from other states besides Louisiana. Perhaps you could help us uh, by telling us what's going on in other areas. I want a question that has come in here. Are interveners more for blind slash deaf child as opposed to blind child or deaf child? In other words, would a de individual who's deaf or an individual who's blind or an individual to deafblind benefit from the intervener? That's a really good question. Uh, very appropriate. Um, the difference is that for a child who's deaf, they have what's called a compensatory sense. So a child with hearing loss still has their vision and they use their vision to compensate for the lack of hearing. And we know that from history and from research that we have um, those deaf individuals who just do very well. They do just fine. They have language and they use sign language or whatever they choose, but they have a compensatory distance sense. And that's the same with a blind child. We know that blind children hear and that they actually develop, their brain develops more in the auditory areas. And so they have a compensatory sense. Again, that helps them to access information. And the difference there is uh, a child who's deafblind does not have a compensatory sense. Even though they may have some vision and or some hearing, neither one is strong enough to really uh, supplement or to act as if um, there, it was a compensatory sense. So the learning shifts. That's the difference, the learning shifts, and it goes more toward that pyramid. So to answer the question, interveners are very specific to deafblind children because of the access issue and because the learning is different. Thanks, Linda. Other questions?
How about my colleagues from the special school district? Have we answered some of your questions? Uh, maybe while people are thinking, I could just mention some of the questions that people do ask about uh, dependency related to interveners. That over the years has been a, a recurring question that it's going to create having a person there, you know, who's that connected to that child, that's going to create dependency on that child. And we have many we have studies and research that shows that is not the case and so if that comes up or that's asked the inter it's really a training issue the interveners have to be trained not to create dependency and the goal and what they're trained to do is to facilitate expressive language to facilitate choice making um, accountability on the part of the deafblind person and to really work on those self-determination strategies and methods. So um, that has been a question that's been problematic. And uh, the answer is no, they, they, they are trained not to create dependency. Here's another question. Um, this is from Aaron Klein and it's actually, uh, hi Linda, great info, thanks. Coming to you from Delaware, I know several people who think the OHOA modules are the same, are easier, more time efficient, are free as higher education. Any tips on the difference and or how to convince them that higher ed is worth it? <laughs> uh, thank you, Aaron. That's a, a very interesting question. That is asked a lot, ask, actually. Um, I've asked that question and it's asked a lot. and um it's there is a difference there is a difference the ahoa modules have been developed and are uh, a, um, like a library if you think of what a library is it's full of information and videos and uh di different bits and pieces of information that have been developed over time by people in the field and experts in the field the difference there is that higher education is a curriculum-based learning, whereas the AHOA modules are more like going into a library. And um, again, my comments are based on my own experience and feedback from different interveners. And so there is, there is a difference in self-study where you're going into a library and trying to pick up and put everything together in terms of a craft and following a step-by-step -step curriculum where the instructor has decided that you have to learn A before you go on to B, that, that M won't make any sense, you know, unless you've covered A, B, and C. And those of you that are higher ed will know that that's part of the trick of teaching is trying to figure out the step-by-step -step process of learning. So there is a difference there. And also those who go through I believe can't do have the opportunity to become certified through a para center, the para two center in Colorado. So it's a different path, a different type of curriculum, the higher ed curriculum. We have a lot of data behind it. Um, and again, of course, you know, you'll hear it from me at Phil, you know, it seems like that step-by-step -step learning and the higher ed experience is the way, again, that the system tells us we have to really be pursuing in order to be recognized as this being um, a profession. So there is a difference. If anybody wants more information, you know, we can provide that or others can provide that. Thank you, Linda. I didn't tell everybody how to raise your hand, so just in case you're being shy and you don't know how to raise your hand. If you, at the bottom of your screen, if you press the participants button, it will open up a participant list and there is a raise the hand button there. So if there's been a reason for you not to raise your hand, 
we'd be happy to take care of that for you. I'll just go ahead and mention one other question that comes up and that has to do with the intervener in the classroom and how they work with the teacher and the team. Uh, there is a resource on intervener.org called Interveners in the Class Lines Guideline or in the Classroom Guidelines for Teams. The intervener doesn't take over the responsibility of the teacher. That's something that makes some people uncomfortable. The intervener works under the direction of the teacher, just like others in the classroom. Uh, and then the intervener works collaboratively with the teacher related to the curriculum, related to any adaptations that need to be made. Um, interveners and teachers make terrific teams. I've seen some really, really fabulous, outstanding examples of teachers and interveners who work together and team members who work together with uh, these children and just amazing things occur uh, when these students have the information they need, when they have the support, when they're calm, when they're not freaked out all the time at school and when they can start to learn, we're seeing just some wonderful child outcomes, some real improved child outcomes that we haven't seen uh, in, in, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we weren't seeing those kinds of outcomes, but they're happening now. Thank you, Glenda. Well, it looks like we've used up our time and answered a few questions and provided you a lot of information. So we're hopeful that this has been helpful. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank, thank AUCD for their generous contribution to this and making this possible for us. We'd like to invite each of you to consider being part of the deafblind, deafblind special interest group within AUCD at, where we can continue this conversation and hopefully have others. I also want to thank Linda for her generosity and her willingness to share her experience and the, all of the things that she has learned over the last 18 years. That's hard to believe, Linda, that it's been that long. But uh, thank you again for being such a wonderful presenter and for being so kind to do this for us. Uh, for those of you in the room, Thank you again for being here and for hanging in with us. And we hopefully will be able to offer some additional webinars as we move forward. Thanks again and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you so much.